ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भागवतम फोर्थ कैंटो चैप्टर थर्टी एक्टिविटीज ऑफ द प्रचेताज टेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी Hitavatam hi vidvudi Hitavatam hi vidvudi Bhavyam dine shuvatsalai Bhavyam dine shuvatsalai Yadanusmayate kale Yadanusmayate kale Sabudya bhajarandana Sabudya bhajarandana Dear Lord you are the killer of all inauspicious things you are compassionate upon your poor devotees through the expansion of your archa vigraha you should certainly think of us as your eternal servants purport the form of the lord known as archa vigraha is an expansion of his unlimited potencies when the lord is gradually satisfied with the service of a devotee in due course of time he accepts the devotee as one of his many unalloyed servants by nature the lord is very compassionate therefore the service of neophyte devotees is accepted by the lord as confirmed in bhagavad gita patram pushpam palam toyam yome bhaktya priyachchati taraham bhaktyu pahritam asnami prayatmanah if one offers me with love and devotion a leaf a flower fruit or water i will accept it the devotee offers edibles in the form of vegetables fruits leaves and water to the archa vigraha the lord being bhakta vatsala compassionate upon his devotees accepts these offerings atheists may think that the devotees are engaged in idol worship but the fact is different janardana the supreme lord accepts bhava the attitude of service the neophyte devotee engaged in the worship of the lord may not understand the value of such worship but the supreme lord being bhakta vatsala accepts his devotee and in due course of time takes him home in this connection there's a story about a brahmana who was offering sweet rice to the lord within his mind the brahmana had no money nor any means of worshiping the deity but within his mind he arranged everything nicely he had gold pots to bring water from the sacred rivers to wash the deity and he offered the deity very sumptuous food including sweet rice once before he offered the sweet rice he thought that it was too hot and he thought oh let me test it my it is very hot when he put his finger in the sweet rice to test it his finger was burned and his meditation broken although he was offering food to the lord within his mind the lord accepted it nonetheless consequently the lord in vaikuntha immediately sent a chariot to bring the brahmana back home back to godhead thus it is the duty of every sincere devotee to accept the archa vigraha at home or in the temple and worship the form of a lord as advised in authorized scriptures and directed by the spiritual master translation again dear lord you are the killer of all inauspicious things you are compassionate upon your poor devotees through the expansion of your archa vigraha you should certainly think of us as your eternal servants <coughs> om agena jimanandasya ganjana shalakaya chakshun militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Basadi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare The well, last night was a very nice program many inquisitive persons 
They're in the grip of inauspiciousness. As anyone will be who does not know what is the standard for real human life. How is it to make your life actually successful? Practically no one knows the art, science, and culture of genuine success. If we're an achiever, a typical achiever in a consumer society, we're concerned with getting ahead financially, using our studies in school, not for wisdom, but to propel us upward on the social ladder in terms of money and prestige. This first point is very important to understand. No one gets education these days for wisdom. The whole point of studying for most persons is simply to enhance your economic opportunities. If you tell someone that you're studying something just for the sake of studying it, or you want to learn knowledge, they look at you and ask, well, how's, how is what you're studying going to make the money? You've got to pay back your school loans. <laughs> You've got to get a job. And statistics show these days that for the majority of graduates from higher education, they don't get a job in the field that they studied at school. So what you see is a mass ocean of inauspiciousness in which very few know what is the real standard for measuring success. Yet, like moss flying into the fire, the masses of people are proceeding in this way. By doing so, they're trashing their human form of life. So this is inauspicious. Inauspicious means things that degrade you. They produce bad effects. But we don't see that because we feel very innocent about having material desires. Like, what do you want out of me? The body wants this? The mind wants that? So it's all justified. I was speaking to someone about... They, the person was... trying to practice bhakti yoga and avoid the negative activities that simply amplify the bodily conception of life, intensify the identification with the body as a self. So this particular person had been into some hot water, a relationship that crossed the line into illicit activity, And so I asked, well, why did you do this? Did you think about things beforehand? So she told me, oh, you don't understand. The body is pushing. <laughs> the body is pushing relationship, relationship. The physiology is pushing for physicalness. And then the mind imagines that through the physicalness, there'll be psychological satisfaction and fulfillment. So I said, well, how did you feel afterwards? Horrible. <laughs> so, so I said, do you see what's going on? 
This is sorcery, trickery. That's why sometimes the illusory energy is described as a witch. <laughs> You're presented with one thing, and then what you actually get is something else. How many lifetimes does it take for us to learn that? But we think we have so much time in this life. I can do this. I can do that. It's all part of my self-fulfillment. It's all my agenda. But you ask someone, what's the point of it all? You could be gone from this body any moment. No, well, if it happens, it happens. Cross that bridge when we come to it. I was... Reading a little short something about, and this was on like the front page of one of the most prestigious news media outlets in the world. And they're starting to publicize the thoughts and memoirs of persons who are terminally ill just to make the general public more aware of what it's like to give up your body even at a younger age and so, so you would sympathize with these persons so the woman had terminal cancer she was in her 40s and she was presenting in a most intellectual analytical way that I lost my partner to someone else because he didn't want a partner who's dying of cancer. Uh, so he ran off with someone else. Okay, that's understandable. But what about me? What am I going to do? I just want to have a few more flings before I die. And, but she was expressing it not like some kind of, you know, cockney or some kind of, you know, <laughs> hip hop person. <laughs> she was expressing it very like a professor, you know, such, with such literary finesse. <laughs> but the bottom line was basically get it while you can, you know. <laughs> uh, it's just very intellectually, she was describing. Just a few more flings. And she said, I'm not ashamed to, to, to say this online in the social media. And guys, I've got cancer. I'm dying. I'm open for anything you want to do right now. <laughs> but, it was state, but it wasn't stated in a crass, crude way. It was stated very intellectually. Yeah. <laughs> like... Surely you can understand. This makes sense. <laughs> In other words, let me squeeze every drop of water I can out of this dry towel. You know, you wring a dry towel and hopes a few drops of water come out. That's the program. <laughs> I'm dying of cancer. Why should I be ashamed of it? Why should I hold back? So she ended the article by saying, I'm go right now I'm going to the club and I'm, yeah, I'm going to just let everyone know I'm, I'm ready, I'm open. <laughs> Take me home with you. What does it matter? You know, I'll be dead soon, so <laughs> what, what, do you expect me, what else do you expect me to do? Just let me seize the opportunity for sense gratification while I can. Because, and then she had to specify, while I can means in the interludes between chemotherapy. Because when she's undergoing chemotherapy, you know, it's, it's too miserable to indulge in sense gratification. So uh, she doesn't even have a clear, a clear field. She's, she's got interludes of 
She's got periods of chemotherapy. So she's got to time everything. Okay, I've got a, a break in my chemotherapy. Where are the guys? <laughs> Next month I start chemo again. So guys, here's your chance. <laughs> And this is presented, as I said, all so eloquently. I envied her literary finesse, but what <laughs> what's the bottom line for all this? It's animal life. Now some would say, oh, come on, Swami, be sympathetic. <laughs> Who would say that? Aaron, you would say that? <laughs> Who? Anyone? Denise? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Be sympathetic, you know. She, you know, she doesn't know anything about higher goals in life. She's just trying to do the best she can. Yes? Disco, what do you say? You would say that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How about some Netherlands liberality, you know? <laughs> some Amsterdam consciousness. <laughs> we feel sorry for her. We don't ridicule. We feel compassionate and sorry. That's why we're going through all this effort to distribute these books, to have programs, like last night at Cafe Atma. So it's not that we just criticize. We're working night and day, overtime, to give people the real knowledge and real solution. Of course, some may say we're biased. Jessica told me that yesterday. Well, you know, you've been doing the Krishna Bhakti thing for so long. You, you know, you obviously are biased. I said, well, what, biased about what? <laughs> she couldn't answer. <laughs> but it sounds like a cool thing to say, you know. You're biased, you know. You know. Okay. She's been doing triathlon for so long since she was a gymnast. I said, you're biased. You're biased toward the body. I, okay, I'm biased toward Krishna. Now we have to analyze which is the best bias. <laughs> Everything is subjective because we're subjective entities. We're persons with consciousness. And then there's the supreme subjective person. That's Krishna. So we have to evaluate what is the best approach in life. And when we do that, we feel sorry for such a person as this lady who has no idea, is not even thinking about what happens after death. To her, it makes perfect sense. In between chemo sessions, I'll go to the club and you know, I'll advertise on the social media. Hey guys, no need for formalities. <laughs> it is on the front page of the, of the, of the very equivalent of what's the uh, sophisticated media in, in the UK? Was it the, the Times? Guardian, yes. Yeah, you know, this is New York Times, equivalent of the Guardian. And so this is inauspiciousness. Hmm. And the inauspiciousness is so thick, it's choking people. They can't think straight. So if we can give them a chance to have their brain stimulated spiritually, it's such a great charitable effort, such a great welfare work to get them to start turning over their engine in, in their brain. Yeah, huh. okay, yeah. Man, yeah, makes sense. Maybe they don't do it all right away in terms of taking up a sane lifestyle. But just that the thought enters the mind. That's a great achievement. You may not see progress in this lifetime. 
but they've got to start somewhere. So this is how broad the vision is of Krishna's devotee. You're not just trying to affect one lifetime. You're seeking to affect the whole chain of someone's existence. And we're ready to accept the fact that not everyone can get it together in bhakti in one lifetime. We could have been like such persons in our previous life who just, yeah, what you say sounds good, yeah. Yeah, I should be, I should be more spiritual. I should understand who I am, yeah. We, we could have been like that. And then we heard it in our previous life and just left it at that. Had some prasad, participated in a little kirtan. Yeah, nice, yeah. I felt less stressed, yeah. <laughs> but that appreciation though so brief stays with you into your next life so you accumulate your spiritual progress so we're not in it just for helping people in this lifetime we'll plant the seeds and then it's up to them what they make of it. We can't live people's lives for them. But we can give them the best opportunity for auspiciousness. To have a favorable life. Regardless of the birth, death, disease, and old age. Which will afflict everyone. So Krishna is known as a Bhadra Randana. Very beautiful name that means, oh killer of all inauspiciousness. We're drowning in such an ocean of inauspiciousness, we can't cope with it on our own. Nor does Krishna ask you to cope with it on your own. So you may say, well, if Krishna cares for us so much, why did he allow us to go to the material world and take a material body? Why? Why didn't Krishna force us not to go into material existence. <clears throat> but as we often point out, how can there be love when there's force? <clears throat> there has to be choice. And choice means you can choose properly or improperly. Of course, whatever you choose, is, it's all Krishna's energy. But it's our natural constitutional position to choose Krishna's spiritual energy. But even if you choose the material energy, it's still you're still you're choosing Krishna. You can't get away. But in our mind, we dream. I've gotten away. I've got. I've got my life. <laughs> We're like four-year-old children who insist to the parent or parents, I can pay the mortgage. Give, give me a car. <laughs> I can pay for the car and drive it. Everyone says, You're, this is crazy. You're a four-year-old kid. No, I can do it. <laughs> That's what we're like. So how is it that if Krishna is all merciful, he allows us to enter material existence into the illusion, the bias of material existence. If you want to say we're biased toward Krishna, you say yes, because we're Krishna's parts. When you say someone's biased toward Krishna, it implies that there's some kind of neutral zone. All right, you're biased toward Krishna. Someone else is biased toward Brexit or whatever. <laughs> and there's this neutral zone where there's no bias. Forget it. There's no neutral zone. You have to be under the influence of something. Now it's your job as a human being to find the best influence because you have to. What do they call drunken driving here? DUI, driving under the influence? Or, but, yes? I know none of you have done it. but <laughs> DUI, driving under the influence. You must, as a 
tiny, minute particle of Krishna. You must be under some kind of influence. You've got to be DUI one way or another. So you choose the best influence, the best bias. This notion of neutrality is a myth. Well, I'm open to everything, you know. I, uh, I don't uh, get caught up by this or caught up by that. I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just unbiased and objective and neutral. Forget it. <laughs> Existence doesn't work that way. You're either under the influence of the spiritual energy, Krishna's internal potency, or the external energy, Krishna's illusory potency. You can't get away from Krishna. So why shouldn't we be biased toward the ultimate source of all energies? But then someone will say, but that's just your version. Well, tell us your version then. Oh, I don't know, but anyway, it's just your version. <laughs> In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives the process to verify what he's saying. So where, where's the process to verify your version? You can't even recognize that you have one. You can't even recognize all the consumerist propaganda that's been downloaded into your consciousness. You can't even recognize all the hedonistic body identification, body fulfillment propaganda that's been downloaded into your consciousness. And you think, oh, I'm neutral, but you've got the Krishna bias. <laughs> We're very happy to be biased toward Krishna. That's the nature of love. And even in what people call a loving relationship in material existence, that means you favor a certain person. You're inclined toward a certain person. And certainly we want our inclinations to Krishna. We want them to be aroused, revived. So then again, the question is still there. What are we doing in material existence? Why isn't Krishna cruel to allow us to try to enjoy this hoax, this mirage? But no, Krishna has done that affectionately. It's a subtle point, kind of hard to understand. How could anyone affectionately allow you to drown in an ocean of inauspiciousness? Well, first of all, material existence does not affect the spirit soul. As the Vedas say, asango hyam purusha. There's actually never any contact between matter and spirit. You just imagine there is. And it's the false ego that accomplishes this miracle of spirit thinking it's matter. So still, how can, how can Krishna affectionately allow us to enter material existence? Where... Where is Krishna's compassion that we hear so much about? You are compassionate upon your poor devotees. Well, you, you let me come here. <laughs> Where's your compassion? Where's your affection? <laughs> but we insisted. I heard a very beautiful way Srila Prabhupada explained the psychology. A parent has a naughty child who just insists, insists, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want, I want, I want. Finally, she'll probably explain, to keep the child from going berserk with these desires, the parent says, all right, all right. But that's done affectionately. What can I do? You insist, you insist, you insist. I don't want you to have a total breakdown because you can't do it. That ever happened to anyone as a kid? Or, yes, you, were, you happened to you, Targana? <laughs> <laughs> Your parents just said, oh. <laughs> Otherwise, you just totally blow out all your circuits. I want. Why don't you let me do this? I want. I, uh. 
So because the parent actually loves the child, the parent's thinking, rather than you have a complete meltdown and go berserk, all right, go do it. Subtle point. So this is how Krishna affectionately allows us to come to material existence. It's reluctantly, but out of affection. I don't want you going berserk. So, okay, do your thing. You'll find out. <clears throat> and of course, no matter what kind of body we take, Krishna is there with us. Where do you find such a friend? Even if you take a body of a chicken or a dog, Krishna is there as the super soul accompanying your soul. And of course, Krishna is unaffected by the material surroundings, whereas we are totally affected. <clears throat> so yes, we are proud to be biased toward Krishna because that bias is founded on the most comprehensive spiritual knowledge and experience of that knowledge. And the experience has to start somewhere. If you want to be an athlete, you have to start somewhere. You don't immediately enter the pros when you're eight years old. <laughs> You've got to start somewhere. Whether you're a rugby player or a football player or a gymnast, you, you don't just immediately start off at the Olympics or, the, or in the Premier League or something. But gradually your skills increase. Now, that we've discussed the Krishna bias, what about the, the bias toward illusion? In which we let our senses just carry us wherever they want. We let our mind just drive us into this situation and that situation. And we're told that this is natural. Your body is feeling like this, you go for it. Your mind is feeling like that, you go for it. What about that bias? Oh, that's okay, because everyone's doing that. But you, Krishna devotees, are going in a different direction. Therefore, we're calling you out for your Krishna bias. All right, we're biased towards illusion, but everyone's doing that, so it's more acceptable. It takes a lot of work in getting persons to see the illusions that are driving their life, the drivers of their existence. It takes a lot of work. Simultaneously, we're introducing them to the Krishna influence and why the Krishna influence is the best. So as I was explaining last night, we don't simply tell people, you got to believe, you got to believe. We're offering them the bhakti process so they can gradually experience that Krishna is unlimitedly attractive. The more you become genuinely purified, the more naturally you'll flow toward Krishna. We were explaining yesterday or the day before, about the prayer by Rupa Goswami. I know young boys are attracted to young girls. I know young girls are attracted to young boys. I'm simply praying to you, Krishna, that my mind will be attracted to you in the same spontaneous way. This is natural. Just as we think it's natural if you're a what? A 21-year-old guy. I've told you before, when the, when the guy is 21, he's at the peak of the hormone, the male hormone cycle. So he's like a walking firestorm. <laughs> Anyone 21 here? Anyone? 22, 20? Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> So if a voluptuous, shapely, aromatic young lady walks in the room, 
Just a b- <laughs> <laughs> it's a bias, right? <laughs> <laughs> you check out the topography. <laughs> yeah. And then, oops, actually, we're devotees, we don't do that. <laughs> but Rupa Goswami's prayer means that we acknowledge the bias of material existence, but we're purifying ourselves so that we can come under the influence of the Krishna bias. Let Krishna attract me. His name, form, qualities, his activities. So when you hear Kirtan, when you hear talks about Krishna, Srimad Bhagavatam, <laughs> so choose your bias. Just as people are lonely in the material world for someone else, we want to feel lonely for Krishna. Where are you? So you take your pick how you're going to be biased and how you're going to respond to the various influences. It's your responsibility as a human being to choose the best influence. Now educate yourself about that. No, I've got other things to study. Business administration, engineering. How about studying the unlimitedly attractive Krishna? Huh? You're biased. <laughs> but you will study the inauspicious attractions of the material world that just disappoint you. You put all your faith and hopes in someone's body and mind. And that's what material relationships are about. I help your body and mind, you help my body and mind. And t- Put it all together, and it's love. We're selfish, materially speaking. We're concerned with our own physical and psychological fulfillment, and the other person is supposed to contribute to that. And you're supposed to contribute to that other person in terms of their physical and psychological needs. And you make a deal. When you go through tough times, I'll be there. Now when I go through tough times, you better be there. (laughs) All kinds of negotiations, arbitrations, (laughs) working out the deal this way, working out the deal that way. So you've got all these deals, all these negotiations bundled together with some perfume or cologne poured on top. (laughs) But what else is there to do? Often people say that to you. What else is there to do? We're just trying to make the best of life. That's the same thing this lady said who was dying of terminal cancer. I'm just trying to do the best. What do you want out of me, you know? I got in between my chemo sessions when I'm in in the chemotherapy, I'm in such pain. But in between, during the interludes, you know, I've got to use whatever moments I have left in life because that's it. When death comes, that's it. How can you blame me? Are you one of those foolish believers in the next life? That there's life after the body? <laughs> so this is a great tragedy. This immersion in inauspiciousness. Then we have Krishna's mercy. Which is not religious belief or doctrine or theology. Krishna's mercy can be experienced by purified senses. Even the neophyte in bhakti has experience. Otherwise, you wouldn't stay here. Okay, guys, we want you to stay here because of, simply because of theology and doctrine. 
<laughs> place should be empty. But no, you're getting a taste. First of all, you're feeling relief from the blazing fire of material existence. And that in of itself is very substantial. But you're, it's not just negative. You're also tasting the positive. You're developing or reviving your attraction to Krishna. And that is the most natural, organic experience. And everything we're doing is an authorized, authentic process. It's not something that someone just speculated or dreamt up. This is bhakti. You do like this, you do like that. No. But from the deity worship to the chanting to how food is prepared, every aspect of our life is in accordance with authenticity. Now, sometimes people don't like that. They say, wait a minute. Just because the Acharyas, those whom you say are expert in loving Krishna, have said, do like this and do like that, that means you have to do it? Just in real spirituality means invent your own way. Be creative. But that's not the nature of real love. Even in material life. If you claim to love someone, that means you're going to take the time and care to understand the ways and means how that person wants to be treated. People say that's what a relationship is all about. You find out what pleases the other person. The other person finds out what pleases you. But when it comes to spiritual life, oh, anything, just what's all this about authorized bhakti practices? Just throw anything at Krishna. That's real freedom in spirituality, anything. Now, Krishna is a person and he has specific ways that he likes to be pleased. He likes it when you approach him through his devotees more than he likes when you approach him directly. So bhakti is the system for relating to Krishna as Krishna wants to be related to. So we're so personal in our illusory temporary affairs, but when it comes to spiritual life, we become immediately so impersonal. Do we expect someone who comes here who has a partner and then goes back to their partner and says, you know, I had a realization. I should just treat you any way I like. <laughs> How long is the relationship going to last? What, why, why do you specify? Why do you say it's this way or that way or that way? I can treat you any way I like, and you better accept it. <laughs> How long is that relationship going to last? You can ask those who have experience, Tarkanath or Shantarup. <laughs> How long would that kind of relationship last? It's no relationship. What do you mean? You know, love means just anything and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Be open. Be, be open-minded. <laughs> so when it comes to real life, it, it, in terms of, relatively speaking, in terms of illusory existence, that is, people are very specific. I want to be treated this way and that way, and you should be doing this and that. When it comes to spiritual life, well, anything, you know, the whatever, you know. And why are there authorized ways of pleasing Krishna? If Krishna is truly compassionate, he'll just accept anything. That's impersonalism. If Krishna is Supreme Personality, Godhead, 
It's natural that there are specific ways for pleasing Krishna. Now you may say, well, you accept that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You have that bias, but what about others? Okay, tell us about the others. Well, I don't know anything about others, but anyway, it's not Krishna. <laughs> this is nonsense. You're not in neutral territory. You're influenced either this way or that way. And even in conditioned life, material life, you have to relate to people as they want to be related to. Okay, for a short time you can endure not being treated the way you want to be treated. Right? For a short time. But sooner or later, what do you say to the other person? You know, uh, we've got to work some things out. Uh. <laughs> I was speaking, uh, I was, for some reason this came to my mind during a Janmashtami class at New Rajadha. Uh, <laughs> I might have said it before here, but I haven't said it in a few years. So uh, I, was, I was telling them that there are psychologists in the USA have analyzed that and discovered that there are two words that married men fear the most. So I, then I told them, well, it, maybe in Hungary it's different. <laughs> what are those two words? Let's talk. Because, <laughs> you know, the man's terrorist. Like, what's coming? Oh, my God. <laughs> what does she want, a divorce? Or wants another house? Or another kid? Oh, my God, let's talk. <laughs> It just, it just strikes terror in the heart of a man. <laughs> You've ever done that? Let, let's talk. <laughs> What's that? We need to talk. <laughs> I'm just saying things. Let's, you know, we has no idea what's coming, you know? It's like, oh, no. Because <laughs> the guy is usually thinking that, you know, things are proceeding smoothly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My ego is being worshipped. <laughs> I'm the Lord of the universe. And then, let's talk. <laughs> so, uh, psychologists recommend that instead of the lady saying, let's talk, and leaving the man in total uh, desolation and total uh, bewilderment, like, what's coming next? Instead, what you're supposed to say is, Let's talk for 10 minutes about you're not washing the pots properly. <laughs> and the guy, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> so what's wrong with Krishna having specific ways that he likes? Specific things that he likes. That's being, That's all about being a person. He is hungry for bhakti, for the bhava of his devotees. Although he's unlimited and perfect and complete and self-sufficient, he still wants his relationships with his devotees to increase unlimitedly. It's all part of his being unlimited. It's not that Krishna is needy. He's self-sufficient. But he wants, as part of his unlimitedness, he wants to expand unlimitedly his, uh, his relationships with devotees. So that's what the bhakti process is all about. Krishna's unlimited expansion of affection with his devotees. All right, any questions? Yes. This term gradual is used. How, how do we uh, understand that gradual, that the Lord will gradually reveal to us? How do we maintain that uh, faith and hope? Is that gradual revealing? 
even the neophyte is getting realization. <clears throat> Just like if you're driving from Cardiff to London, I've seen on the motorway the signs are telling you London this many miles, or, what do you use here, miles or kilometers? This many miles, and you, you know I'm getting closer and closer. So even for the beginner in bhakti, you get realization of how you're on the right track and how you're getting closer to Krishna. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. Now there may be times when you feel that uh, your spiritual life is getting dry. That means you do things to, re to revive the relationship. Maybe last time I was here, I was explaining what used to go on in Western society maybe 40 or 50 years ago. I don't know if it happened in the UK, but in the US they had a thing called the second honeymoon. Never had it here. Never heard of the second honeymoon? It was back in the 50s and 60s when persons marriage lasted more than 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, by the time the 10th year or the 20th year came around, the relationship could be a bit frayed and a lot of familiarity. And so the common thing was to, to go on a second honeymoon. The first honeymoon is when you first marry. Then the second one is down the road when you worn each other out and you know, it got on each other's nerves and... You, so you go on a second honeymoon to revive the fire, you know, to reignite the fire. <clears throat> they had special places for this in the USA. One of them, I remember what my parents went to. They had what's called dude ranches. You know what a dude ranch is? <laughs> yeah, like these Ranches like in the Western movies where you ride horses and you <laughs> You act like a cowboy, you know <laughs> And so they're especially for couples that want the second honeymoon to reignite the fire <laughs> So in the material world it's acknowledged that relationships wear down and sometimes, because of our familiarity with Krishna and our contaminated consciousness, we feel like we're in a dry patch in our bhakti. But use those times to come closer to Krishna, to revive and regenerate your spiritual practices, take them to another level. That way you make good use of such periods. Like I was explaining to the people last night, the saying that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. First chapter of Bhagavad Gita is a crisis. Arjuna is in a massive crisis, but he uses it to come closer to Krishna. So when there's a crisis in your spiritual life, a crisis in your march back to Krishna, use that crisis how to deepen your spiritual practices. Use everything in Krishna's service, even dry spells and crises. <laughs> I just want to do to the four human defects um, if we will be ever able to perceive actually reality of things as they are. Yes, because Krishna is the master of the senses. He's Hrishikesh, and he can allow that you perceive reality. You can't do it on your own. You're too tiny. <laughs> <laughs> Again, what I said the other day, gradually the prasad will taste better and better <laughs> because of Hrishikesh, Krishna, the master of the senses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everyone's looking like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the kirtans will be sweeter and sweeter. The association with devotees will become sweeter. 
We're not the controllers of our senses. We always think, well, it's all up to me, and when am I going to be able to see Krishna more or experience Krishna more? It's not all up to you. Krishna is the master of the senses. Because of your bhakti, Krishna allows you to perceive more of his nectarian glories. Any questions from this side? All right, yes? Well, so I have one more question. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I haven't had the good fortune yet to uh, probably be in one of your programs where you um, preach to, you know, um, to neophytes and stuff like this, but I uh, heard that you know, you've had so much success in that. So probably in a matter of preaching to other people, um, what's like the general do's and don'ts that we as devotees can take so we can get Krishna out there without overwhelming them too much? As I... Explain. You have to be able to gauge their appetite and stimulate it. You don't have to always operate within the confines of their current appetite. You have to know how to stimulate their appetite. That takes expertise, but you build up that expertise by trying. You're not mistaken if you overdose someone. You're telling them the right thing, but it may not be the right time or the best way, but you're not wrong. If someone tells you, I'm open to so many things, you're closed, you're fixed on Krishna. You don't have to immediately tell them, look, you're in total Maya. <laughs> but you're not wrong if you say that. But, it's, but gradually you'll develop better techniques for administering the medicine. Just like a mother who wants her child to take medicine. The medicine is bitter, but the mother knows how to coax the little child to take it. It may taste bad at first, but you'll feel so healthy shortly after. Trust me. So gradually you'll become extra. But you have to start somewhere. I wasn't always doing what I'm doing now in, the, in this way when I was, you know, in, what, I don't know how many years ago, 40 years ago? No. Yeah, I remember. I was just the new Bhakta, 1973. And soon after I moved into the ashram, I was going to young people's homes and dragging them out of their homes. You got, come on, let's go. <laughs> really, I was doing that. Pack your bag now, let's go. <laughs> I wasn't wrong. I mean, I was just, you know, enthusiastic young devotee. I wasn't wrong, but gradually you learn more and more effective techniques. But yeah, I used to do that. <laughs> yes? Isn't it, isn't it an, an offense to the Holy Name to uh, over-preach to someone, like uh, instructing if this is better than? If they are obviously an outright just look. Just what you're doing is nonsense. <laughs> yes, then it's an offense to speak further about Krishna's personal glories, and that means the glories of the Hare Krishna mantra. If they're just outright antagonistic. Just like you. If someone's antagonistic toward you, you don't reveal your personal secrets. Only if someone wins your confidence and trust, or if they're least gentlemanly or ladylike, would you reveal your mind. So why expose Krishna to that? Krishna's a person. The 
Hare Krishna Mantra is a person. So if someone is just totally blockheaded and just, I don't believe any of this spiritual stuff. You guys are out of it. <laughs> but no, no, let me tell you the glories of the holy name. <laughs> You have to use discrimination and judgment. Okay. <laughs>